Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you right now, Father God, according to your word. You said that the pestilence would not bother us, Lord God, and if there's a plague that comes, it'll not come near us. Father, and though a thousand fall at our right hand and 10,000 at our left, Father, it'll not fall on us. Father, because we know that in the name of Jesus, we are protected, we are kept by the the uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, his exaltation to the right hand of the Father, where he was given dominion and power over all things. Father, and it is only that last enemy that has not been put under his feet. So, Father, we declare that this enemy, coronavirus, COVID-19, whatever else people want to call it, Father, in Jesus' name, it has already been put under his feet. And we thank you, Father God, that the people of Messiah Community Church and the people of faith in the body of Christ, Lord God, all over this country will not fall sick with this thing. But in Jesus' name, Father, they shall be immune to all effects of this plague. We thank you for it. We give you praise and honor for it. Father, we thank you for all those who are recovering. Father, we pray for for Sarah and for Sally, and we pray, Father God, for, for Steve and for Kay. Father, we pray for Brother Chuck, that in Jesus' name, they will all recover, Lord God, and recoup all that the enemy has taken from them and the different things that have hit their life. Father, we pray in Jesus' name for Angela and her family. Father, on the, the death of Ma Bowen, Father, give Mike peace and comfort. It's been a long road for them, Lord God, having her at home with dementia. And Father God, in Jesus' name, we just pray the peace of God that passes all understanding. Cover that entire family, and we thank you for it. Give us a great time tonight, a great lesson, Lord God, to know your word, in this, especially in these perilous times. We thank you, and we praise you. We lift you up and give you glory and honor. For Jesus is Lord of all the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we have a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, Richard, that is a good comment and that you don't see that on uh, the television or newscast, anybody's newscast, really, that the uh, type A flu has killed way many more people than coronavirus has. But coronavirus is uh, not known, is very contagious, and for people who are already vulnerable to respiratory ailments, it, it, is, um, it is very, very dangerous. So we want to pray that the Lord, um, yeah, you're, you're exactly right, Richard, on the numbers and that. But um, people are in fear, and they're in fear, I think, because of the unknown. And that's always the way it is. The, the devil um, will not stop. It uh, it put trying to put people, the people of faith, especially in the fear. And there are people who can't be visited in the hospitals. We have all those hospital workers out there and doctors and nurses who are feeling it right now, They're working a lot of extra shifts and all kinds of stuff because people are in fear. And it's not just um, fear of the virus. It, it's fear that's causing a lot of other extended issues. So we just pray for all them, too. In the name of Jesus, Father, protect every healthcare worker. Strengthen them in the innermost being, Lord God, all the docs and nurses. Father, all those who are working in the labs, Father, protect them. Keep them safe from this virus. And Father God, let them know that you are the very God of heaven who saves, delivers, and heals, and that you can be a shield around them, the glory and protector of their head, O oh Lord God, and lift them up in the mighty name of Jesus. You see, we see that, yeah, the nursing homes and the assisted living centers are all in lockdown. It's crazy. But we understand because of the, the way this virus is and not knowing anything about it and it being so resistant to all the normal treatments. Um, we just, you know, there's panic worldwide over it because it, is, it has been so contagious. And pass in so many different ways. I think that's what makes it different. It, you kind of get a comfort level, I think. You know, you think of the flu. And I'll tell you the other thing that they're not telling people out there. And that is that this is a pneumonia virus. That's what one of the things that is making it so doggone bad is it's a pneumonia virus. 
Um, it's not just a flu. It's, a, it's actually a pneumonia virus. So be praying against that. It's a plague. We need to pray and just stay in faith in Jesus' name. So let's get on our lesson because we've got a good one in it. Uh, the Lord just plans these things out. It does relate to give us some peace in this time. Remember this town called Sodom. Um, and you may remember its sister city, twin city, Gomorrah. Um, yeah, Ed, I heard that too, that an Israeli doctor is working on a cure for this. Um, and, and they will be blessed in it. They, they surely will. Exactly right, Richard. People die because they can't breathe. Um, Dad, thanks for thanks for that safety tip. If anybody gets a delivery at home, make sure you um, make sure you wipe your hands. Let's take a look here. Genesis chapter 18, verses 22 through 33. Then the men turned away from where from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood still before the Lord and Abraham came and said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now, these two guys got up and left the party. You know, Abraham, the, when we left off last week, Abraham was having a, a little brunch with the Lord and with two angels. And in having the brunch, the two men get up and leave. Now, they weren't, it doesn't really say that they were given direction or anything like that, but Abraham instinctively knew that something was wrong. And so God tells him, he says, well, should I hide this thing from Abraham? And he's my friend. I'm going to tell him. And that's what God does with us. That's why what we see in Christ is so good. Because in Christ, the Lord tells us the deep things, the hidden things of God. He, he passes them on to us, whether it's because you're praying in the spirit and you're getting them supernaturally. Or you're looking in his word and the spirit. And by the way, I would advise you as you read through the word to pray in the spirit first and ask God to give you understanding of it. And it would be really, really good for you to have understanding of everything that you're reading. The best way to get that is to pray that the Holy Spirit opens your eyes to it. And so Abraham, God's friend, God tells him, hey, yeah, I'm going to destroy Sodom. And Abraham turns to God and he said, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now, he's appealing to God's very nature. And, and that is God's merciful. In a face-to-face -face meeting with Jesus, because that's who he's meeting with here, Abraham begins to negotiate for the lives of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And by the way, these or this was one of the worst uh, wicked places on the planet at the time. And we get the term sodomy from Sodom. And we get... Um, a lot of information about really grotesque stuff, all from the city of Sodom. And, and we know as um, when, when the angels entered into Sodom and they just wanted to get Lot out of there. And the men of the city were going after those angels, not the women of the city, the men of the city. And they were saying, give us those men. We want to know them in a biblical way. You know what I mean? We want to know them. And, and so this is a wicked place. And yet Abraham's going to go to God because his nephew Lot's there and ask God for mercy for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I want to ask you, there's a few things we, we need to understand it here about God. Abraham says a little bit later down in the conversation. Far be it from you to do such a thing as this to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sake. Hey, Richard, can you send a message to Barb and tell her to log off and log right back in and she should get her sound? So here, notice Abraham's words to the Lord. See how Abraham knows and understands the character of the Lord. He sees and understands the character 
of the Lord. Listen what he says. Far be it from you. Now, how does Abraham know that it would be far from God's nature to destroy the whole town if there were 50 righteous? Yet, Ed, he did. He did know that. He knew um, that Lot was there with the wicked. He absolutely did know that. And, and that's why uh, Abraham's appealing, because he wants Lot's life to be saved. But he starts out with 100, and then he starts working his way down. He gets all the way down to 10. But how does Abraham know that God's character is that way? Well, the only way he could is if he had been spending time with the Lord. If, he, if he's spending time with him, and he's, um, he's really understanding his character. i just give you, for instance, I checked out a couple websites, and I checked out a couple YouTubes of people talking about the coronavirus. Some, some pretty big name prophets and prophets and, and pastors and things talking on the Internet. Now, here's what they're saying. And, and this, I'm not, um, I, I want to be kind about what I say and, and write about it. And, and I'm not trying to judge anybody. Just take a look at the scriptures. Take a look at how God is talking to Abraham right now. And God's, Abraham's talking to God right now. And then think back, the most wicked cities on the planet, Sodom and Gomorrah. They were sexually wicked. They were uh, idolatrous. These were not good people. Yeah, we got to pay attention to God's character. And yet in this day and age, knowing what we know about Jesus, knowing that in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, knowing all of that, we have people who have names, have reputations, have a platform saying this coronavirus is God's judgment on America for X, Y, and Z. For X, Y, and Z. Oh, this is what happens when a nation forsakes the Lord. Now, I do believe that when, when you live an ungodly life or you have an ungodly, um, you have either an ungodly life or you live an ungodly way, or you are idolatrous in your, your character, all those type things. I, I do believe you're sowing seed, but it's the earth that'll reap a harvest to you. It isn't the Lord. Jesus said in John chapter three, I did not come to judge the world. I didn't come to judge the world. He said, I came to redeem the world, not to judge the world. And that through me, the world would be saved. Now. There are natural consequences in the earth to sin. Yeah, Mike, good point. Abraham did know that there wasn't 50 righteous, and, and he continued his, his downward spir spiral, didn't he, until he got to 10. He was, he was hoping maybe there were 10. I, I think he was counting Lot, Lot's wife, Lot's two daughters, and their husbands, and, and none of that happened, right? And, and um, yeah, Abraham's spirit was identifying. That is a great point, Mike. Abraham's spirit was identifying with God's spirit. And God's spirit right now is the spirit of Christ. That's the spirit we see. Jesus has already come. He has already died for every single man, for every known sin, for everything that there is. Jesus died for all of it. Jesus isn't in the judgment business because he already died to declare judgment on all sin. So whatever virus or plague that hits the earth, it is a not natural consequence in the earth to what man does, not a judgment of God. And, and so if, good point, Richard, if Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and he's already done that for us, Abraham is in the right spot. We now, now we can we can put Abraham in 2020. We can put Abraham here. And we could be saying to God right now, and I think this is what all the folks on uh whatever 
program they're on should be saying, far be it from you, Lord. This is Lord, this isn't in your character. And, and that's exactly the message that should be put out there to the world at large. This isn't God's character. It's in God's character to save. It's in God's character to heal. It's in God's character to raise the dead, open the blind eyes, uh, take care of the leper. That's all in God's character. It is not God's character to strike a, a nation with a plague. That's just not in God's character. Uh, when the tsunami hit and it, and it happened to hit a bunch of Islamic nations, people were saying, well, it was the judgment of God on Islam. No, it wasn't. Something happened in the earth. There was a tsunami and it wiped out a whole bunch of people. And there's a great big fault that runs down there around Indonesia and down to Australia. There's a fault line under the ocean that runs there. If it shifts, guess what? You get a tsunami. Well, you have a God caused the tsunami because he wanted. No, God would that all men, all men, all men would be saved. None would come. None would come into a judgment. So, so if that's God's will, that all men would be saved, we're right in line with what Abraham says. Far be it from you, Lord. Far be it from you. Yeah, and Jesus has already come. And when Abraham was alive, Jesus had not come. And, and yet Abraham recognizes the character of Christ. He recognizes his character. He knows that God says, I am the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and mighty. Forgiving sins and iniquities to a thousand generations. I, I don't think we passed a thousand generations on drugs, abortion, uh, pornography, any of that stuff. I don't think we passed a thousand generations yet. So can't be a judgment from God. And we notice right here, Abraham, re knowing Abraham, knowing Abraham's relationship with God, we ought to have a great amount of peace and comfort. Just in our normal everyday Christian life, regardless of whatever else is going on, viruses or not, we ought to have a lot of peace and grace. To know that God knows these are the two most wicked cities on the planet at the time. And he, Abraham knows there's not 100, there's not 50, there's not even 20. In reality, there's not even 10. And Abraham goes to God. Far be it from you, right? Look at Genesis 18, 32 and 33. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. So the Lord went his way as soon as he had finished speaking with Abraham and Abraham returned to his place. Now, this makes you think, and listen, I've been in the car business and, and I've seen people negotiate for something, you know, and when somebody agrees with you on something, you, you haven't gotten a no out of them. They're still saying yes, shaking. Keep negotiating. I <laughs> mean, it's the way it works. Keep negotiating. Abraham gets God to 10. And, and he says, hey, God, Lord, I don't want you to be angry with me. Let me just speak one more time. God never says he's angry with him. Never. He doesn't say, Abraham, if you ask me one more time, that's it. I'm, I've had it with you, son. He never says that, does he? Makes you think if Abraham would have dropped the five, maybe Sodom and Gomorrah would have never happened. Think about that. But Abraham stops at 10. He knows there's not 10 there. Because if you count lots two, he and his wife, he's got two daughters, that's four. They both have husbands, that's six. He's four short. And he knows it. So Abraham left some he left some negotiating on the table with God um, then let's take a look here in the conversation of Genesis 18 we find Abraham addressing God as Lord in Hebrew this is yut he vav he you read from right to left in my Hebrew letters there right yut he vav he yud the work he revelation of grace vav to secure Hey, once again, revelation or grace. You don't use the same definition twice in Hebrew. So the Lord, as Abraham knows him, is literally the work of revelation that secures grace. Now we find out when Moses says, what sh who should I say sent me? And he says, tell them the Lord, the Lord God. And then he gives him this big, long name. Well, the big, long name is explaining 
the work of grace secure or the work of revelation secures grace the big thing that god explains when he says this is my name and then he explains who he is that is all who god is that that's his name his name is mercy his name is grace his name is forgiveness that's his name because it's all wrapped up in that one name yud hey vav hey which gets translated by the way is yahweh or english transliteration jehovah now the hebrews referred to him as the eternal or ever existent one now this speaks to god's immutability in immortality, but also speaks to the fact that he knows everything from the beginning. God knows, you've heard it many times, I'm sure, in church, God knows the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end. God knows everything. And when Abraham is addressing the Lord this way, he's recognizing that the Lord knows it all. He already knows how many in Sodom. He already knows how many are going to get destroyed. He already knows everything there is about Abraham and Sarah. But the more revealed about him, the more favor we have the ability to access. See, there's a lot of things we don't access as believers. And this comes out in Abraham. This reason why I said, who, you know, how did Abraham know this character of God? Well, it's obvious because he had been studying God. I mean, chasing after him. He didn't have books in that to read. He didn't have all kinds of things, you know, a book on the character of God and the personality of God and so on and so forth. Abraham didn't have any. That books weren't invented then. But what he did have is a personal relationship with him. He knew what God told him. He knew that what God told him, he reaffirmed to him. He knew all of those things as he went along. So he knows the character of God through personal relationship. The more he knows about God, he has the ability to access God at this point in time when God's ready to bring the hammer down on Sodom and Gomorrah and say, hey, this isn't your character to do this. You know, we can talk to God and we can ask him for the word to be done that's in his character. It's the reason why Jesus tells us, whatever you ask in my name, he isn't saying use a magic wand and just say Jesus and that does it. No, that's that's not that's not the use of the name Jesus. We ask in his name, his name back in Hebrew uh, life back then, the name meant something. It meant everything to do with their character, everything to do with everything that they were. It meant all their promises, all the things that they had stood for. It was all the internal things of God. That's why Jesus said that. You haven't asked anything of the Father yet, but now you're going to ask of the Father. And when you do, ask in my name. Ask with the character, with the personality, with all the grace that's in Christ and all the things that Jesus did. That's how you're asking. Not just saying, oh, yeah, let me stamp Jesus' name on it and God will have to do it. No, God is looking for you to understand who Jesus is. Because in understanding who he is, you understand who the Father is. Yeah, good verse, Richard. Uh, Richard popped a verse in there for us, Exodus 33, 19. And the Lord said, I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and have compassion on whom I will have compassion. You see how God answers Abraham? I mean, answers Moses there in Exodus 33? He, he gives his name through his character. That's how he gives his name, by explaining his character. And he doesn't say, I'm going to cause my awesomeness, and my greatness to, to go before you. No, he says, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you. I'm going to cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. You wonder why I preach grace? Right there. Look at Jeremiah 16, 19 through 21. O oh Lord, my strength and my fortress, my refuge in the day of affliction. Think about when this is. My refuge in the day of affliction. This isn't a good time. This isn't we just won the pennant or the Super Bowl. This is the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come to you from the ends of the earth and say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, worthlessness, and unprofitable things. 
Will a man make gods for himself, which are not gods? Therefore, behold, I will this once cause them to know. I will cause them to know my hand and my might, and they shall know that my name is the Lord. Now, the Lord goes on here to say he's going to rescue Israel. And, and he's saying, listen, our fathers inherited worthless lies and, and unprofitable things. How much worthless stuff, unprofitable stuff, do you think the people of Sodom and Gomorrah knew? How about the people of the United States, other countries? Therefore, behold, the Lord's going to cause them to know. He's going to cause them to know his hand and his might through deliverance. In Jesus, we experienced all of it. Jeremiah opens our eyes to this fact. God wants us to know who he is. Jeremiah 24, 6 and 7. For I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. Not I'm going to set my, my eyes on them for bad. I'm not setting my eyes on them to judge them. I'm not setting my eyes on them to punish them. That's not what he said. I set my eyes on them for good. When God sets his eyes on us, it's for good. That's why he sent Jesus. To set his eyes on all the people of the earth. Jesus came for all of us. So we see in the Old Testament, God's bringing out his own character, which is Christ. And I will bring them back to this land. I will build them and not pull them down. And I will plant them and not pluck them up. Then I will give them a heart to know me. That I am the Lord. The yud heh vav right? I am the Lord. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and they shall return to me with their whole heart. Look what the Lord says about Israel, what he's going to do for Israel. Then I will give them a heart to know me. What did Jesus do for us? Gave us a spirit, gave us a heart to know him. Richard, I'm certainly hoping that a lot of people wake up through this corona thing. And, and yet, God says that prophetic word, Jesus repeats it, and it's repeated again back in the epistles. It's a good word for us to know. I will write my laws upon their heart. And he, when he's talking about that, when he's talking about writing it on our heart, he's not talking about putting the Ten Commandments, writing it on our heart. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt. You know, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the law of love. Yeah, the laws of goodness and faith. All of those things, he's talking about writing them on, his, on our heart. God tells Jeremiah his intentions for Israel to return to him and that he will give them a heart to know him. It's a heart to know him. The Lord isn't interested in, destru in the destruction of mankind. In fact, he, take, he says, I take no pleasure in a sinner dying. I take no pleasure in the unrighteous dying. It's what the Lord says. I don't take any pleasure in that. Now, Abraham's tapping into that. It is exactly the same thing that Jesus told us when he said, I came to give my life that all men would be saved. That none would come to destruction. None would fall into judgment. Now, see, when we can call upon, the God like, uh, upon God like Abraham did, man, we're getting somewhere. When we have that kind of relationship, when we can understand that the, the relationship that Abraham was modeling was a relationship that we really as believers, we ought to tap into because there's a whole lot more to it than, than just that. Take a look at Matthew 13, 10 through 12. And the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. but to them." It has not been given. For whoever has to him, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Jesus is telling his disciples here that they've been given the, the special ability through the Spirit to know his ways and to understand the kingdom of God. But it's not just for them. It's for us. It is, it is for us. Believers get to know. That's the reason why Paul prayed the things he prayed at the beginning of the book of Ephesians. 
And he prays for the Galatians the same way. And, and he prays for the Corinthian church. Paul's always continually praying for people. In, in, the, in the New Testament, in the epistles, Paul is praying for people all the time that we might know Christ. That we might know the, the depth of his love for us the grace that he has, that we might know, have knowledge of his, an understanding of his, uh, of the mysteries of Christ, which is the hope of Christ in us, the hope of glory, that we might get that all. Paul's continually uh, calling that out to us. And, and it's all about knowing him. You see how we get in the Old Testament. We get, we get to see Abraham. We get to see Moses. We get to see uh, David, who God says, this is a man after my own heart. And I see, thief, murderer, liar. I mean, he's got all kinds of things going on in his life. And God says, there's a man after my own heart. Why? Because he does everything right? No, because his heart is right toward God. Who he recognizes of God is right. He recognizes God is just that way. I will cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord. In your presence, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. What a great verse. It is the devil's mission. Good word. Devil's mission to kill, steal, and destroy. God's mission is to bring us to life. Take a look here at John 17, 25 through 26. Jesus is praying. He's praying for the disciples, and he's praying for all believers. It says, this is why people, even some Christians, don't understand the spiritual side of the gifts God gives to those who understand. You're exactly right, Ed, because they're, they're looking with blinded eyes. that they, they, they can't understand the parables. And Jesus told his disciples, hey, I've given to you to understand this parable. But other people, and I speak to people that way, other people, they're not going to get this. They're just not going to understand. Look what Jesus prays over his disciples. O oh, righteous Father, the Lord has not known you, but I have known you. But I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name. What does Jesus say here? Do you say, I declare to them your judgment. I declare to them your, um, your awesomeness. I declare to them your power. No, nope. I declare to them your name. Now, when he's praying this, those hearing him pray, understand he is talking about the totality of the name of the Lord. yud heh bafe the work of revelation secures grace. He's telling them all about that. He's saying, listen, pay attention to the totality of the character name of God. All the different names, Jehovah Yireh, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Mikadesh, uh, all of those names. Think about all of those names when they, like we, we talked about the other day um, or last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago, when Hagar called that well. And she called the well uh, Jehovah Beher Leroy, the God who sees, right? Think about that. All of those names are character names of who God is. They, they all give us a glimpse into an understanding about how big and powerful God is, but through his name. Because you didn't get named something just like, you know, that pull name out of a hat and say, hey, I think I named the kid this, you know. It wasn't like that. In fact, Jesus' name that he was given by God was not just Jesus or Jesus. It was Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. He was given that name. And even the very name Jesus is the God who saves. So when he says I've declared to them your name. He's saying, I declare to them everything there is to know about your character. And I will declare it. Listen to what he says. That the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. This is about the love of God being put into the disciples. You get that? Let that sink in for a minute. 
I have declared to them your name and will declare it with for this purpose. I'm, I'm giving them your name, the name that Abraham had, the name that Moses had, the name that David understood, the name that Jeremiah understood and Isaiah understood, the name that all the prophets of old understood. I'm giving them that name so that the love with which you love me might be in them. Because when they can access everything that you are, when, when we sit and we think, man, the Lord just doesn't see me. He, he, he doesn't even know what's going on in my life. He doesn't know the failures I had. He doesn't know the hardships. He doesn't know the hurt. He doesn't know the pain. He doesn't know the disappointments. The Lord doesn't know any of that. He doesn't know how I'm sitting here in my house and I haven't been outside for four days. And, and because, you know, the coronavirus is floating around and might attack me at any moment. And, and I'm, I'm here in my house. My kids are making me crazy or uh, I can't stand watching any more news because that's all they keep talking about. And we say, well, the Lord just doesn't know. If he knew, why wouldn't he change all this? We can call him that name. Jehovah Beher Leroy. Right? Which, which means the God who sees. God does see. We know that. When we're flat broke, Jehovah Yireh or Yahweh Yireh, the God who is my supply. Or the God who is infinite supply is actually the better translation. The God who is infinite supply. When we're sick, he's Jehovah Rapha, the God that healeth us. When we need peace in our life, because we're just going bonkers. You know, we're in distress. He is. Right? He is Yahweh Shalom. Shalom. Means complete peace. Ah. Rest, peace over everything. It's who he says he is. Jesus said he was giving us his peace. Well, where did he get that from? From the name of his father. Jesus prays that we might know that father's name. This knowing isn't just knowing who he is, but his character and his ways. It, it's, it is known through his name which Jesus tells the Father he has declared to them. In this name, we find revelation. The more revelation we have in understanding the revelation, it, it, it wakes up our heart. It puts faith in our heart. Then we can start calling out things. Then we won't be in fear. That's why he says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Well, how can you have that? Because you have the spirit. The Spirit comes in the name of the Lord. The Spirit comes in his name. The Spirit is his name. The Spirit is actually teaching us his name. Take a look here. Genesis 20, 3 through 7. We, we, get, we can really get a big picture of, of how God deals with Abraham and, and how God was before the law. For people who believed him. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Now, I'll give you the background for this story. Abraham's traveling along. There's a guy named Abimelech. Abimelech, actually, I'll show you this in a little bit, it just means the son of, or the uh, father of a king. So Abimelech is some type of a ruler or a king. It's not actually his name. Um, they don't tell us who this is, which king it is. Some believe it's this guy and some believe it's that guy. We just know it is a king in that region. God comes to him in a dream by night and says to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. See, he looked at Sarah and Sarah said, on Abraham's orders, I'm his sister. Now, she's a 90-year-old woman. How many 90-year-old woman women do you know? That, that men are like, wow, I can't wait to get her in the, into my harem. But that's exactly what happened. Right? Abraham here is acting not out of faith, but out of fear. And Joyce, that's a great comment. Fear is paralyzing. It, it absolutely is. But if you know your God, like Abraham, Abraham's in fear right here. But, but God gives him a great lesson. 
But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, now this is Abimelech. It doesn't say he's a believer. In fact, Abraham's the only guy carrying on with God right now. Abimelech is not. Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of your heart and innocence of my hands, in the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I have not done this or I have done this. He, he had touched her. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did not did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Wow. This is a guy who's not necessarily, you know, he isn't following in Abraham's footsteps. He's not a totally a God believing type of guy. But here God's talking to him and God says, hey, I didn't let you touch her. I spared you. I was merciful to you. And I kept you from sinning against me. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. So his whole house is going to be wiped out. Forget the harem that he's got going. The whole house is going to be wiped out because he he wouldn't release Abraham's wife, Sarah. Now, this is a real interesting dream in this conversation that goes on because Number one, Abimelech recognizes God as God. I don't know how many dreams he had. Um, it, it, it was it was fairly common, Dad, but Abraham explains it that um, Sarah was the the daughter of his father, but not the daughter of his mother. So they were they were half half sister and brother, and yeah. That was a fairly common thing. You could marry close like that, first cousins and so on. Um, so he recognizes God is God. He also realizes the favor of God for Abraham and on Abraham. God gives him an ultimatum that he can, he has a choice. He can either ignore it or heed it. Now, why was Abimelech, literally the father of kings, afraid of a dream? What made him afraid of a dream? He was more fearful of this dream than Abraham was of him, I can guarantee you. Notice it says that God withheld him from violating Sarah. God said that. He says, I withheld you. I didn't let you do it. That puts a whole new twist on people who, you know, want to blame the devil or anybody else for or God for them committing some type of sin, right? God says, I, I didn't let you do it. Take a look at Genesis 20, 14 through 16. Then this is the outcome. Now, now Abimelech uh, releases Sarah, obviously. And, and God chastises, you know, uh, Abimelech, but he doesn't chastise Abraham. Now think about that. God doesn't chastise Abraham. Abraham lied about it, Sarah being his sister. He he, not first time, the second time he's done it. He did it to the king of Egypt as well, and, and he's lying about this, and he's camped outside. Who knows what he's thinking? He knows Sarah is supposed to be the the mother of the promised child, right? And he's messing up here. But look at how God repays Abraham. Then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, and male and female servants and gave them to Abraham. And he restored Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, see, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. Go do whatever you want. That's how much his dream scared Abimelech. Go do whatever you want. Then Sarah, he said, then to Sarah, he said, behold, I have given you, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus, she was rebuked. Now, think about that. Now, how, how would you like to get rebuked like this? You do something wrong, and the person that you wronged didn't let you get wronged, 
and pays you with a whole bunch of cattle and, and servants and then gives you a thousand pieces of silver to vindicate the wrong that you did to them. <laughs> That's what happens in, this, in the process of this. He rebukes Sarah by giving Abraham money to redeem her. I'm telling you, God's amazing. We can, now, now don't go out and do wrong things and then wait for God to, uh, to redeem you out of this, okay? Um, and, and have all kind of, kinds of people shower you with money. Uh, Abraham had a very special place in God's heart, just like we do. And, and it's amazing what God will do, even when we're in a wrong place. God will deliver us and do things for us that we never dreamed of. Yeah. Good, good word, Nancy. Nancy says, yes, of course, you may share. Oh, OK. Good word. I forgot. I forgot to share this. This would be a good time, right? Well, I'm talking about people doing something wrong. No, 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 no. Um, I, I did want to share Nancy McFadden's testimony. She she was um, has been for several days sick, really sick. Um, and this has nothing to do with Nancy being doing anything wrong, by the way. I would just want to make sure I clear that up. But I, I just want to share this because she had been like pretty doggone sick. And in the middle of being sick, um, she just went to the Lord and started started praying and believing the Lord. And, and she had been suffering for days and days and days. And in the middle of that, the Lord delivered her, just completely restored. Uh, her body to where she wasn't in pain anymore. And she just realized she wasn't in pain, um, which is an amazing thing for us. Think about that for, for people who um, after being sick for a whole week, she says, I was just so tired and just wanted to sleep. Didn't think I could handle another night of going to the, to the, uh, the restroom every 10 minutes. She cried out to God to help me and slowly started reciting all the names of Jesus I could remember. And she says, Messiah, Jehovah, Yireh, wonderful counselor, mighty king, prince of peace, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. After several minutes, I stopped realizing all the pain had left and I fell asleep shortly afterward. I slept really well that night. Such a blessing. Amen. Amen. And and she she knows. And think about that now. It it's right in what we're talking about, the name of God here. Abimelech's afraid of the name of God. Abraham's using the name of God. The the name of God is speaking of his character. When we're beginning to speak those things over our life, the Lord redeems us, just like he did Abraham. He'll bring all kinds of things out of the woodwork for us. Now, think about this one, because this is in the same vein as that. And this is Hagar and her son Ishmael. Genesis 21, 17 through 20. And God heard the voice of the lad. Uh, Abraham kicked him out. And uh, Ishmael was crying to the Lord. I heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, what ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make him a great nation. This is the second time God's promised that. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. So God was with the lad and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. God's promise to Abraham extends out to Ishmael, whether Ishmael's right, he's going to be right for eternity or whatever, God doesn't break his promises. And when he appeared to Abraham and told him about child, he didn't break his promise. When he, when he told Abraham about what was going to happen with Ishmael, he doesn't break his promise. When he tells Hagar what's going to happen to Ishmael, God doesn't break his promise. So if he promised, like Nancy was praying there, if he promised one of the names of God, Jehovah Rapha, and, 
and Jesus, the very the very name Jesus, uh, the God who saves, um, and um, I'll trying to think of the other name, uh, Emmanuel, the very name Emmanuel, um, God with us. All of those names of God promise us that if he's with us, we're healed. Nancy starts calling on the name of the Lord and she gets healed. Uh, Ishmael is calling on the name of the Lord. He gets he he gets deliverance from, from being out in the wilderness and, and dying of thirst. And he becomes a great nation, exactly how God promised. Abraham, calling upon the name of the Lord, he gets his promised child. Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Now, this plainly says that God tested Abraham. Now, does God test us? If he does, for what purpose? Or is the testing a proving ground? Hmm. Let's take a look. 1 Peter 1, 6-9. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, how does this compare to a lot of theology? I know an awful lot of faith theology It says about Abraham. I mean, Abraham's talking to the Lord. He's got a personal relationship with the Lord. He's got a promised child, a boy that he had dreamed of having. He gets that boy by his wife, Sarah, who is uh, 90 years old when she has him. She, I mean, there's a lot of things that go on here. And then God says, hey, go up and offer up a sacrifice. Take your son with you. I want you to want you to sacrifice him. Abraham drops it all. Hey, Isaac, come on, come with me. We're going to go up to the mountain. By the way, here's the wood. You got to carry it up to the top. What are we going to do? We're going to offer a sacrifice. Oh, OK. They start going up the side of the, the hill to the mountaintop where they're going to do the sacrifice. And God's testing him. There, here in 1 Peter, it says, your faith may be tested by fire, though it is tested by fire, but it's much, much more precious than gold. And it's going to be found to praise, honor, and glory. Take a look at James 1, 12 through 14. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, this word temptation is tempest. Tempest is a swirling wind that you get sucked into. You can't help it. You just kind of get sucked into it. And, and it's he says, blessed is the man who endures that. He will receive a crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Does God tempt us with good since he doesn't tempt us with evil? I mean, does God drop a million dollars in your lap? So see, if, yeah, and I know people will say, well, this is just a trial from God to see if I'm going to pass or not. Listen, all life's a trial. <laughs> all of life is a trial. And, and we're, we're put in a hot seat by the devil all the time. Yet, yeah, Richard, you're, you're exactly right. Um, Abraham did know that if need be, God would raise his son up. The scriptures teach us that. And, and also... The the rabbis teach that, that if perhaps he did end up slaying his son, 
that he would, um, God would raise that son back up. Abraham had full faith in that. Yeah, Abraham did know. That is exactly right. Abraham knew that God was in his camp. It's it's a great word, isn't it? Yeah, Joyce, you know, dysfunction is part of the fall. And and we have um we we have a lot of dysfunction and and dysentery and dismay and delirium and all kinds of other stuff, all result of the fall. And and when we can know that we can call on the name of the Lord, just as James is telling us, just as Peter's telling us, when we are tried, we're we're our faith is much more precious than gold. We'll get through it. Take a look here at Genesis 22, 7 through 8. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire in the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went up together. Now, think about this, because this is how I always pictured this. I always pictured this. Got Abraham, some old guy, hundred and something years old. He's got, you know, he's got this son, little kid, nine, ten, maybe thirteen, innocent, skipping along, you know. Hey, Dad, uh, what's up with this wood? Do you hear that I'm you? You having me carry? And you know, you said we were going up here to make a sacrifice, but but where's the sacrifice? Where, where's the where's the sacrifice? We get, we had the fire and we got the wood, but you know where's the sacrifice, at, Dad? And and then God or Abraham looks back and he says, "My son, God's going to provide lamb for himself." And the kid, not knowing much, he, oh okay, that, yeah, that's great. Thank you, thank you, Lord. And 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 they move on. What happens though if you know the real age of Isaac, and he ends up he's not a little boy? Does it make the image change and also change his response to Abraham for you in your head? Do you do you get, get understand this different? Yeah, actually, Ed, it looks like Isaac, most of the Hebrew scholars put him about 37. The reason why they do is because Sarah had him at 90. She dies at 27 or 127. She dies at 127. This 37 year spread. This immediately follows that, Genesis 23, 1 through 2. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of life of Sarah. So Sarah died at Kerjath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Now, according to the Hebrew Midrash, Sarah died right after the account of Isaac being offered on the mount. It said that she had a heart attack thereafter at the thought of losing the promised son. The Hebrews believe Isaac to be 37 at time of the attempted sacrifice, or real close to that. It happened that Sarah's heart just couldn't stand it anymore, the thought of losing this kid. As a man, we see the faith of Isaac a little clearer than as a boy, with little knowledge of life. It gives you some insight into what Abraham taught his son for Isaac at let's say he is mid 30s he knows a whole lot more than a 12 year old kid or an 8 year old kid or even a 20 year old kid he knows a whole lot more about life he knows a whole lot more about Abraham's experience with God almighty and when he's asked to go make the sacrifice with him. Yeah, he wonders, looks around. Hey, where's the sacrifice, Dad? The Lord's going to provide it, son. I think he knew in his heart right then. I was it. I was the sacrifice. But my dad knew God would take care of it because that is not in the character of God to have a man sacrifice his own child. Think about that one. Think about that one. 
we ought to all have this kind of faith, the faith of Abraham in our life. We, especially now, don't get in fear. Think about what God is doing and what God has done. Think about all the history of God. Think about everything that the Lord has done through the course of time. How God has ministered to us, how God has kept us, how God has taken care of of those that he calls his. It's all him. Yeah, exactly, Joyce. Isaac also knew from, from Abraham the God that Abraham served. Isaac knew it. It's an awesome thing. See why we got to see why we need to study the Old Testament. See why we need to take a look at it. Soak it in. Understand it. Look at how much is there in the course of an, an hour. How many things we uncovered about the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Can that fit in today's climate of fear? Fear mongering by by so many news that can't get off the message. Listen, it doesn't make any difference what the name of something is. The Bible tells us that Jesus, the name of Jesus Christ, is the name that is above every name that is named upon the earth. Proclaim the name of Jesus over you, over your house. Take the Holy Communion with your family, with your children, with your husband, with your wife. Pray Psalm 91. Let the Lord know that you know his promises. Don't let your your faith be tempted or tested. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Amen. Listen, God bless everybody. Y'all have a great night. We will be praying for you. Nancy, thank you for a great testimony. Great testimony. Call on the name of the Lord. Call on the name of the Lord and you shall be saved. And this nation shall also be saved. Amen. Blessings to everybody. Go in the peace and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. May his favor shine upon you. And may you see his presence and feel his presence all around you. And be safe, healthy, and whole. Because Yahweh Shalom, the God of peace, rest upon you. In Jesus' name. Have a great night, guys.